Hello again. This is the Hypnotorious Podcast. David Barron with me is John Wiley. Hello, John. Hi, everybody. And uh, as you know, if you've been listening regularly, we uh, publish this every week. We are hypnotists. Uh, and basically talking about anything that is regarding hypnosis. And it's really for anybody who is interested in hypnosis, whether they're uh, just a bystander, likes to study it, uh, to someone who is seriously wanting to use it to make a change, and even for professional hypnotists. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what's a great topic we can talk about today, John? I think what we should talk about is pre-talk. The pre-talk. Oh, good. Pre-talk, Tell me. Interview, etc. Yeah. Well, I have my own idea of what pre-talk means. What does that mean to you? Well, I think that the pre-talk. Um, I think we're pretty much on the same page here. Is uh, right from the very first moment that you uh, have contact with that potential client, you're starting your pre-talk. Mm-hmm. I th- yeah, and I think a lot of uh, hypnotists have been trained to limit their pre-talk to, you know, when the client is getting ready to do hypnosis in the chair. And uh, I'm I'm so familiar. I've seen it so many times uh, that that it's and it's often the very same pre-talk, no matter who you're who who is doing it, uh, where they talk about the conscious and the subconscious mind and the critical factor and you know how the subconscious mind is like the bottom of the iceberg and and it's a very useful understanding uh it usually takes about 20 minutes to go through the whole that particular pre-talk um and it is useful information and and typically what it is designed to do is get the client comfortable and have an understanding in some way or another of, of what hypnosis is. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. If, I have some general feelings about, about that particular pre-talk. What do you think about it? Well, I think um, uh, long before you actually sit down with the client and have that, that uh, educational, informative question answering session, um, for example, when I answer the phone, and this is kind of a little secret. I, I may, I maybe shouldn't share. Okay. <laughs> do you know what? I, I'm going to anyway. I'll share um, some of my secrets and you share some okay. of yours. Okay. Okay. So when I answer the phone, I answer the phone. Hello, this is John Wiley with Boise Hypnosis. How can I help you succeed? And I think that's, that's a really good uh uh, it's a great way to answer the phone. It's mm-hmm. also the really great beginnings of a pre-talk because you're setting the frame there right, uh, right from the outset. And then, um, of course, you know we have our conversation. I give them an opportunity to get all their questions answered. I explain how to find me and, and the basics of the process. Right. And then, of course, once they sit down, um, uh, they fill out a little bit of paperwork. Part of it I fill out with them. Uh, for several reasons, but I like to show them a video, and I know okay. not everybody is is that way, but I've found that useful. That that way, um, I make sure that certain things get covered. Right. What what and what is your video describe? I I uh, my video uh, basically talks about um, how your hypnotist or hypnotherapist thinks of uh, the mind. The the model, certainly not the only model, but it's the the model that most uh, hypnotherapists ascribe to that of that of the the unconscious mind, mm-hmm. the subconscious mind, the conscious mind. This particular video video differentiates the difference between the unconscious mind and the subconscious mind, but that's not necessarily uh, critical. It's not really that important in my opinion, right. but this particular one does, and it talks about examples. Um, lots of really good examples of everyday uh, times when people experience hypnosis, they just don't realize it. Things like when they're driving in their car or when they're making a sandwich and, and they can't find the mustard, you know, and uh, 
there's a, a fun little story in there that I uh, reiterate in my book um, about uh, negative hallucinations and how easy it is for those kinds of things to happen even in mundane situations like making a sandwich to mm -hmm. negatively hallucinate. And I think all those things are very important. Um, what about you? What kinds of things do you cover in your pre-talk? Well, I mean, um, for me, again, the pre-talk is the very, it starts at the very first, first contact with the client. And I have a whole bunch of things I want to just assume in that conversation or presume. So I want to presume that I am the preeminent authority in the area. So I will, the first thing I'll always do is I'll ask them to describe it in as much detail, uh, whatever they want to change. Uh -huh. And most of the time, you know, having done it long enough, I've seen it all. So I can actually say uh, I have worked with that and uh, it is something I I'm very familiar with, I've had some very good success with it. So I'm not promising they're going to succeed, but I'm telling them my history is it something that, that I've been successful good. at. Um, and then uh, and then I will uh, describe, uh, what I use the word commitment. I say, what I do is I require a three session commitment from my clients. And I describe the what each of the three sessions are very briefly. And uh, again, and, and I, I will also, during that time, talk about, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I've had this particular practice, <clears throat> excuse me, for this amount of time. And um, then uh, that's, and this is again during just the phone call. What I will then do is I want to presume that I'm hard to schedule, so I will tell them, I'll say, I do have my calendar here. Let me look at it and see if I can find an opening. I never say an appointment. I don't say, let's schedule an appointment. I say, let me see if there's an opening. So again, we're using a little bit of scarcity. Yeah, uh, that's the, important. The very last, I that too. yeah, the very last thing I say that I remind them is that uh, I, I remind them that uh, in order to secure this appointment, I need a credit card uh, number, and I don't charge the credit card. But and this simply is something that adds the air of professional uh, professionalism to me because I do not like people making appointments and not showing up. So right. in that way, they're also, they're very committed. Um, I also let them know I'm going to send them some information by email and there are certain things they have to read and maybe fill out beforehand. This goes along with uh, a study that says if you can have, if someone buys a product, and they at least do something interacting with the product, they become more committed to it. So for example, you, you f listen to a infomercial and you buy this, this um, call it a nutritional supplement, and you buy mm -hmm. it for $3 the first payment, but then a whole bunch of money in subsequent payments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you have this, uh, this uh, a real incredible opportunity to uh, to turn back and say maybe this is really stupid but if they say put this in the refrigerator store in the refrigerator you're now interacting with this product and doing something with it that means you're investing time in it mm -hmm. and so I have them uh, I send them those forms so that they interact with that and they become more and more invested in the whole process and the forms have some information as about what they can do. You know, like they can already start to listen to some hypnosis audios that I have. And I, you know, share the link with that. That only helps them, you know, get more, their mind more prepared to the hypnosis that, that we would do. Um, right. Now, when, when I sit down with them, often the very first thing I like to do is I want to compliment them and thank them for their sincerity, you know, and their and being and they're being genuinely wanting to change. 
and I do that for a, it's a behavioral engineering uh, process I learned from the ellipsis manual by Chase Hughes. If you mention sincerity in any context, people now have that in their awareness and they are attend to going to act sincerely. Mm -hmm. You're priming for it, in other words. Exactly, priming for sincerity. Um, uh, let's see, a couple things I do want to point out during this pre-talk is I talk about the conscious and the subconscious mind. And I don't need to do in a lot of detail. I, I just want right. them to know that the mind has these parts to it. And I typically say, you know, the conscious mind is the part that wants you to change. And everyone comes to me because they want to make a change consciously. But the subconscious mind has some other different thing going on. So you may want to stop smoking, but the subconscious mind wants a cigarette. And then I point out it's not broken. It's doing a job that you assigned it, and it's doing it really well. It's now totally outdated, and we just have to give it a new set of information. That tends to make it very simple and understandable. Um, I would like, and the one thing I consistently ask them is if they've done hypnosis before and most have not. So I'll ask them, what do you think it feels like to be hypnotized? Because I want them to sort of imagine being hypnotized. Uh, again, we're priming. Right. And so they'll tell me whatever it is. And I will always agree with it, but I'll also add to that for me what, and I'll say for me what hypnosis is, is an intensely pleasant, wonderful feeling of focus. And I, cause I want them to want to get there. Yeah. And, and I always point out that for it's me, important. my objective is to get your focus so enjoyable and so intense and so pleasurable that you know, when you're done, you open your eyes and you say, wow. And I get that a lot. It doesn't happen all the time, but I get it a lot. Mm -hmm. So again, I want them really eager <laughs> and looking for, That's I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I think we might have talked about this before, going for the wow in hypnosis. Yeah. I, I want them to be just totally blown away from the experience. And then uh, uh, it gets them eager. And then I tell them how simple it is. I says, your responsibility to get there, just follow my instructions. That's it. Just follow my instructions. Yeah. And they'll go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you mean that's it? Yeah, just follow my instructions. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've sort of built it up as incredibly pleasant and then also incredibly simple if you just follow my instructions. Um, and that's pretty much the essence of, of my pre-talk. Uh, Usually that does not take more than five, 10 minutes. Um, and it, the, the important points in that are letting them have an understanding of the subconscious and the conscious mind. Um, um, the second point is how to, uh, how I see hypnosis and how pleasant it is, the experience of being hypnotized and then how simple it is for them to get there. If I'm able to do that, uh, they're they're pretty much ready. So th that's the essence of. It. Very seldom do I find people. That occasionally, I find people I have to do more work with. Um, right. And those I usually what I usually have to do is um, it's called either negative dissociation or positive association. I sort of intuit or find out the the people that they admire and and okay. I will I will use I will say you know let's say for example they they're athletes and I'll say you know one thing I find about really successful athletes is they have the ability to do two things and that is they have the ability to focus but they also know when it's really important to just let go do what you've been trained to do and so and again, that lets them know that what's important is focusing and they value athletes, so they associate that with themselves. That's good. Uh, like that. The other that, one. That idea of surrender, I think, is really important yeah, to touch on. And... Letting go and surrendering. Uh, I have experimented with um, 
having a, a questionnaire form that is designed to sort of prime those sort of things out, like uh, you know, what what do you find, what has had the most positive impact in your life, acceptance or letting go when you're with someone you trust. And so here again, we're sort of priming. I don't use that all the time though, but if you, if I really wanted to get into it, if I really wanted to be super clinical, you know, really put people through the, <laughs> through the, the blender, so to speak, and get them ready to respond quickly, you know, that would be one of the things I would do. Right. And or maybe, maybe if you're running across, um, I can see the value in trying something like that. If you run across somebody that's been to a hypnotist before and they had a lot of trouble, they had difficulty, mm -hmm. um, to uh, take some extra steps like that. That might be right. helpful in a situation like that. Right, right. Um, and uh, uh, I, were, well, I also remember, remember uh, our, our mentor, one of the people who trained us, Jeff Stevens. His entire pre-talk was, what do you want? <laughs> that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he had a good way of justifying it. He said, you know, by the time someone sees me, They've tried everything else. They already know I'm a hypnotist. Uh, they're willing to pay me a fair amount of money just by sitting in my chair. So I don't have to. I don't have to prepare them. I don't have to do a pre-talk. They're ready. And I've tried that, and it works. It works very well uh, for most people. But yeah, um, it worked for him well. It certainly did. It certainly did. Uh, I I really like sort of doing the massaging their mind, getting them really eager for the whole process. Yeah, I like to do things a little differently than that, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other th uh, Oh, how about... The one thing that, that comes to mind is how, how can you arrange your environment of the hypnosis um, room, for example? Because, you know, it in itself is part of the hypnosis experience, and so yeah. when they enter it, it, uh, it is also linked to the pre-talk. It's there to prepare them. It, what have right. you done? Well, there's, there are several things. That's a really good question. Um, previously in my office, and I'm in the process of getting some new frames, but one of the things that I like to do is with pictures. I have a series of three pictures that I like to hang up in my office. The first one is, um, is uh, of a caterpillar. And the next one is uh, a cocoon. And then the next one is a, a beautiful butterfly. And it really elegantly uh, is a beautiful metaphor for change. Um, and I don't point it out or anything. I just, I just position it so that where I set the client as we're having our conversation, uh, it's right in front of them. And they can't help but see it. Right? Wow. Another thing that I do. And these are is, these are three separate pictures that hang yeah, these are, separately. This is a series of three uh, photographs. Oh, you're, you're going to have to post that to your to your Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it. Okay. Yeah, All I right. can do that. All right. Um, but yeah, th that's that's a nice metaphor. Uh, and then another thing that I like to do is I have a a really big, super comfy. Uh, recliner chair and I haven't always had that chair but um, my clients just freaking love that big comfy chair and uh, I don't let them sit in it right away oh, yeah. uh, I'll have them sit down in a straight back chair during our conversation and if they go to sit in the chair when they first come in I uh, will kindly direct them to a different chair or I'll mention you're not ready for the big chair yet, <laughs> and because the the big chair is is kind of an anchor, you know, it's yeah. a, like a spatial anchor, and that's where people go to make uh, powerful and profound changes. And during the pre-talk, um, I'll often make uh, implications around that idea, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then when they do get to to the big chair, it's uh, even more special. Right. That's a special place. Oh, good. That's oh, I like that. Very good. Yeah. Okay. That's... Excellent. Um, I, well, mine. Um, yeah. What's interesting, um, 
I managed to sort of, I too have uh, pretty much a, a, a very sort of nondescript wall. I do have a, a picture hanging that does not really attract too much attention to itself, which is sort of what I like. Um, and again, two chairs. So I will typically, if someone comes a, it's not a straight back chair. It's, it's padded, but it does not recline. And I'll, I'll interview them with, in that. Whenever I do hip, mention hypnosis, I, will, I just point to the other chair. So I'm already mm -hmm. linking that uh, to, the, to the recliner chair. And uh, typically, I, I don't want them really to get too comfortable in hypnosis. I mean, I want them comfortable, but I don't want them going to sleep. So my recliner does not go all the way back. <laughs> you know, oh. It can, it can okay. kick their feet up. Uh, you know, occasionally, uh, I have uh, people who, you know, sort of get in the chair into a fetal position. And, you know, that generally means I have some work to do because they have some security issues. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, uh, it you know, it's the office is 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 comfortable looking. I don't have anything specific other than the chairs that uh, to anchor the, the hypnosis. But I really mm -hmm. like the idea of the butterfly cocoon uh, caterpillar cocoon mm -hmm. and butterfly that's that's really good there is another um now that i think about it um there's a little a little sign that i got from um i picked it up somewhere i can't remember but it's it's made out of wood and it's just uh the wooden letters spelling relax and that's kind of off to the side too and you know it's not something that would really draw somebody's attention but the subconscious notices everything yeah and and little little images and little symbols like that that prime the mind towards uh, relaxation and surrender and all those other mm -hmm. useful things that we've been talking about uh, you know they can be they can be a big help and there's that too and then I like to use um, music in my sessions as well right. and that helps mask background uh, noises mm -hmm. from other things that are going on and uh, and also, it's very soothing. It's very relaxing, and people love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do uh, again talking about the setting and environment. A hypnotist I, I did some work with had a really neat setup. Uh, her chair was the chair for the hypnosis subject would sit in was sort of at an angle and facing uh, a wall, not facing directly, but facing at an angle, the wall, in which if you were in the chair, you were looking at this portrait, and it just everything was sort of focused around this this portrait. So your your attention was very naturally headed in one direction, right in front of you. Mm. Um, and I the portrait didn't have anything to do with uh, hypnosis. It looked like something like a Rembrandt of some sort, but. Um, she had a background behind it and the frame and then everything off to the side and the chair was just nose directed right toward it from an angle. So I thought that was interesting. Again, it's a way of just keeping the attention. And so when people mm -hmm. would sit in there, they would just naturally sort of point their head in that direction because that's the most obvious thing to look at. Um, yeah. yeah. So you've, all, you've already got a, a, a focal point. Mm-hmm. Right out of the shoot, which is helpful. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking also about, um, you know, going back to the times of Anton Mesmer, and how he would uh, pre do the pre-talk. You know, and of course he, he had his own ideas of, uh, you know, the magnetic fluids that are in the body right. and how do he direct them, <laughs> and um, and he'd bring these people into a salon, and he would be dressed up in a, you know, a I don't know what you would call it, a, a surgeon's or no, not a surgeon, a magician's outfit, right. a priest's outfit. Oops, something like and that. he would tell them what's <clears throat> what's going to happen. And then he would do it. And simply because he's demonstrating that authority, people had incredibly dramatic results. And I, so I think part of this also has to do with being able to demonstrate your authority, um, not by saying anything about it, but by your demeanor, by your dress, by your 
state of confidence, and even you know by your website if that's you know uh, a source where you get clients. Um, right. And uh, if you can demonstrate that authority, and and also at the same time, part of that authority is just directing people to do things. So have them sit in this chair, like you said, or. Um, I will occasionally ask someone, reach, could you reach over and hand me a tissue? Just so they get comfortable following instructions. Right. Um, and get, getting those little acts of compliance. So that that's also part of the whole authority and pre-talk uh, thing. And I think I have not really done this to the degree that I could, but you know, if I got a tailored suit, a very, uh, you know, I, I love I love the look that uh, some business people have that demonstrates authority, but it's never been something I've wanted to to do regularly. So no. you know, I just have. I like to look nice uh, when I right. when I see clients, but I hate ties. So yeah, I, I wear a nice button-up dress shirt, nice dress slacks, nice shoes, nice belt without the tie. Yeah. And for my style, I think that's perfect. You know, as you said some really interesting things that I wanted to, um, I wanted to comment on. As far as the, one of the really cool things about the ellipsis manual um, that we were mentioning earlier, is there's a whole section on there, on, on entrainment, and that's taking this idea of, of building um, response potential, building. Um, yeah. Uh, compliance to uh, a whole new level. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, and, and I've I've talked with uh, Chase Hughes who discussed this, and he said with incredible confidence that you know there, no one cannot be hypnotized, especially if you're going to put them through the entrainment process. And okay, so for someone who is list, is not familiar with that. The entrainment process is a simple uh, command and follow the command type of uh, exercise. So it starts off, uh, lift your right hand, lower your right hand. And of course, as you, as the subject hears this, he's simply instructed to do it. And eventually what happens, and the whole objective of this is whatever you say in that moment they do simply as a matter of response the whole idea right. is to get the the neurons of the brain the ones that hear your voice right next to the ones that follow the instruction making and it automatic making it automatic yes an automatic response and I, i've talked with chase and, and he says when he's doing entrainment his goal is that if he is out with one of the subjects he's worked with and he just turns and says sit on the ground they sit on the ground and they don't even give it a thought that's his objective <laughs> yeah. uh, and he can get some wow. incredibly dramatic results with people but um uh, you know he does some also some incredibly interesting experimental types of hypnosis with them too um, so and I do I have not done entrainment to the degree that he does it he does he has four levels of entrainment they each take eh, maybe five six minutes to do and he'll sort of break them up and they go from very simple ones to responses to saying things um, you know, say the word thunderstorm, say the word movie, you know, things like that. Uh, ultimately, the the fourth, the the third level, he has them move about the room, stand up, touch the other, walk to the wall and touch it, sit back down, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the very last one, he does the very same thing, but he induces hypnosis. So they're in a trance state and they're responding. And certainly, I'm convinced if you get someone to that state, um, you're going to have very dramatic results with them. Right. Yeah. So, it, again, it's not something I've brought to the level that he does, but it's impressive. And I, I keep thinking I'm going to, but I don't really find my clients really needing it that much, needing to go to that, that depth. Right. But it's an interesting tool, and it's... It's definitely something that 
would be um, interesting to experiment with, especially with those clients that that um, are have a particularly resistant um, problem that they're they're yeah. trying to trying to resolve. That might be something that somebody would want to spend some time doing yeah, before they I, ever even do hypnosis. I you know I guess I just have to decide to do it. I mean the whole entrainment process uh, to that degree takes maybe about a half hour uh, and so that's just a ha half hour of a normal hypnosis session but by that time I, I would imagine they'd be incredibly responsive you know yeah. you know lots well, there's of one of the things yeah um, and I think that would be kind of fun too to, to play with <laughs> not only not just doing it but also on the receiving end I think that oh yeah it would be interesting um, to to see that develop that that automaticity Right. right. Yeah. I can remember the first time that I was playing with hypnosis. I was doing some self hypnosis, and I started to give my myself suggestions that my arm was starting to get lighter and lighter and lifting and and rising and rising and lifting. And I was it was so amazing when my arm started to all by itself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't lifting it at all. Um, that that feeling of automaticity. Uh, to start to develop in that limb and the arm just starts going up and up and up I'm like damn that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know oh yeah There's one of the things that I wanted to mention too uh, David and as far as um, creating authority um, uh, along the lines of you know we've been talking about doing the entrainment and mm -hmm. and the compliance um, questions you know asking them to do things for you and move here and move there and that's a big part of of uh, Jeffrey Stevens training too right he incorporates that um, but one of the the subtle things that I do in my office is I have my certifications and my my diplomas my credentials or at least some of them not all of them um, it's not really room there for that but um, many of my certificates I have right behind me from the perspective of where I have oh. my client sit. So I am, um, I'm right in front of these, these credentials. Good. And I think that, um, that's a powerful way to communicate that authority to the subconscious mind too. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the, the conscious mind necessarily even recognizes that, but the subconscious mind certainly does. All right. All right. Good point. Very good point. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, one of the things that is, again, conveying authority, uh, the fact that for that I have a secretary that answers my phone calls, that just, yes. that seems, that has a, a, a level or at least a, a answering service of some sort that will answer the phone calls before directing it to me. Yeah. That adds a quality of credibility. That's something I wish I had. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really wish that I had somebody to answer the phone for me because it would be it would be better. I mm. could I will find I know people who will do that for you. <laughs> yeah, but how much how much will they charge? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's another way of doing it. Well, that's um, I'm wondering if there's any other things we can sort of throw in here that, that sort of add to the the quality of a pre-talk yeah um, I think for me again making sure they understand there's a difference between the and I don't again not having to go into big detail but there's a difference between the conscious and the subconscious mind uh, building anticipation for hypnosis by by painting it as just over the top wow amazing and enjoyable and then describing how simple it is to get there those are the those are the three I would teach somebody. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what what would how would you synopsize your your basic pre-talk, and what you'd want to get across. Well, those things. The only other thing that I would add is I think that it's important to make sure that all of your clients' questions are answered. Um, my, one of my goals is I want to make sure that my my client is comfortable right. with entering hypnosis. But, Regardless of the the style that a hypnotherapist may have, you know whether they're they're um, more traditional or 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 super direct like uh, Jeffrey Stevens, or somewhere in between, or or some other style, it's important 
uh, that they feel comfortable, that they feel um, not fearful. Because right. fear, fear will absolutely interfere with the process, will throw a, a wrench in the works. Yeah, um, I think I, sure. I think one of the best, and I agree with you completely, one of the best ways of doing that is, is in the initial phone call, I want them to talk as much as possible about mm -hmm. what the change is, the situation, how it's affected them. And, you know, and I just listen. I come from a place of non-judgment, let them right. know they're welcomed here. And if I can, when we talk next, mention anything that, that I remember them saying in the call, it sort of reconnects them. It tells them at least on some level, okay, this guy was paying attention to me. Right. So, and that's just important, you know, not, don't just go for the appointment, just talk to them, get them really comfortable uh, talking to you and explaining what the situation is. Right. You know, and, and in my experience, that's a really good point. It's a real, uh, in my experience, if you let that client talk, they're, they're not only going to open up to you, but you're not going to have to talk about, um, you know, yeah. as a salesperson would say, closing the deal, they're going to go there. They're going to say, well, well, do you have any time on your schedule? Um, I'd really like to book some sessions. Right. Uh, can we go ahead and do that now? You know, you'll know that, yes, you did it right. Uh, you did it sufficiently when when you start having clients tell you that. Yeah, yeah. And they will. And for, <laughs> you know, me, I know you like to take the credit card. Um, I, I take it one step further, and I have my clients prepay for their session. Yeah. And I explain to them my cancellation policy. You need to give me two business days notice. Um because you know this time slot when you purchase it, it's yours. Yeah. No one can take it away from you. Yeah, um, yeah that so that really that really ups the the priority of you know making the appointment and this is important and I got to pay attention. Yes, yeah. exactly. They're making they've got skin in the game. They're making a commitment with uh, with that payment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's they're gonna probably show up. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, you think? Have they ever not shown up? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Oh, really? And you still have you know? the payment. Oh. That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sometimes they'll prepay and then, and then for whatever reason, you yeah. know. Yeah. And you know, and you know, I'm not a jerk uh, most of the time. If they get sick, I understand. Sometimes you really don't know that you're sick until the day of. Mm -hmm. And if they're sincere, if if, uh, if they strike me as being really genuine and sorry that that they're sick and they're going to miss their appointment, then uh, in most of those situations, I'll go ahead and reschedule them without right. a problem, even if it's the day of, right? right. But um, well, it, that, that doesn't really happen that often, you know? Interesting, that, and that just happened with me today. Um, I got up, my uh, secretary called me and said, you know, the, this appointment called and she's in the hospital. I can't make it. And so I got yeah. it through my secretary and I thought, well, okay. And I made a point of calling up this lady's mom saying, you, you made this appointment for your daughter. I understand completely. Uh, I will be available you know, when you want to schedule an appointment. And I'm just concerned about her well-being and I'm just wishing you the very best. So, yeah, it, you have to be a human being about these things. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, John, another great Hypnotorious podcast. I love this. Uh, I hope some any of the listeners here have any ideas uh, of what to talk about. Uh, we'll cover any area. I mean, we, we've gone to weird places, so <laughs> uh, we'll talk about it if you like. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing this probably every Wednesday. That's, that's when the podcast comes out. And if you have any questions, give us a call. Um, John, talk about your, your practice. I am John Wiley. I own Boise Hypnosis in beautiful Boise, Idaho. I'm the author of The Ultimate Guide to Hypnosis that you can find on Amazon.com. And I'm a good friend of, of David Barron. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, I am David Barron. I uh, uh, operate uh, New Hampshire Hypnosis in Bedford, New Hampshire. I've been operating it for about um, since 2010. And I also operate on the other side of the country in uh, Ontario, Oregon. Uh, so um, in, in Eastern Oregon, hypnosis is the name of the, um, 
So you can find me on easternoregonhypnosis.com or uh, newhampshirehypnosis.com. And, and like John, I have written a couple books. Uh, just Google it. <laughs> You'll find it. Uh, so, John, thank you very much. This has been always great. A lot of fun. Okay. Take Talk care. All right. Bye.